welcome to Hot Weekly. Hello, everyone. I'm Jonathan. I'm Crystal. And this is Haunt Weekly, a weekly podcast we want to direct the entertainment community. Whether you're an actor, owner, or just plain aficionado, we aim to be a podcast for you. And we return to you once again under what can only be described as unusual circumstances. But better than last week. Much, much better than last week. We'll have updates in a little bit about all the follow-up from the storm and everything else. We're going to talk about that. Uh, But first things first, do take a moment, if you have not done so, follow us at hauntweekly.com or hauntweekly on Twitter, hauntweekly on Facebook, youtube.com slash hauntweekly is our YouTube channel. Give us a subscribe there. It really, really helps. iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, wherever you get your pies from, subscribe to us there. Once again, really, really helps. And under normal times, hopefully we'll be getting back to them sooner rather than later, Sundays at 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern, we do these episodes live, but due to Heat Wave and now Hurricane Ida, we have been on idle for that for about a month, Yeah, hoping to get back to that somewhat soon, because we do enjoy doing it live and having the chat going and hearing people's thoughts. Yeah, it's it's much more interesting than just talking to you. (laughs) Yes, it is. I'm sorry I'm so dull. No, I'm sure it goes the other way, too. But yes, indeed. It has been... Quite a week. Um, Update everyone real fast. Uh, As we discussed last episode, uh, the Sunday, I believe it was, was when Hurricane Ida hit Louisiana. Mm -hmm. We stayed for the storm. We had the the means to evacuate, but we checked the forecast. We knew the winds we were expecting, the storm surge we were expecting. We did not feel we were in danger. We were right. Our house managed through the storm just fine. We didn't see any flooding. No catastrophic damage to us or really any house in our neighborhood, honestly. Some roofs damaged, some trees down. A couple of really old sheds that were almost falling down did fall down. Yeah, in some cases, I I borderline call it doing a favor (laughs) on some of those. Just speeding the demolition part of the project along, we'll say. Yeah. But all in all, um, our neighborhood and our area came out great. The part that's been rough is apparently... Ida was a surgical strike on the power system for New Orleans, cutting all of the transmission lines that led to the city. Now, they've been working to get the city hooked back up. Last I'd heard, just under half mm-hmm. had been reconnected, and that half includes us. We yes. got power back Saturday, so just under a week. Uh, we lost early Sunday morning, like at 9 a.m. We lost it ridiculously early. Yeah. And... Um, Got it back Saturday night. Uh, we were actually out of town. We decided to take a one-day evacuation, uh, vacation, slash supply run. We went to the Gulfport, Bay St. Louis area, where we decided to spend a night in a hotel room, mm-hmm. where we could have AC and sleep in a cool room. Yes, yes. It was the first time I was able to get horizontal in almost a week, because I had been sleeping in recliner. Jonathan largely had, too. Yeah. What we'd been doing is we have a, a neighbor who has a whole home generator, and sh- we have internet access that stays up amazingly well. Mm-hmm. Realistically, we never lost internet access through the storm. No. Nope. We had a couple hours on, like, Wednesday where they had a generator problem, but it came right back up. Um, and considering everything that's happened in the city, and that Cox is still out, I believe, citywide. Yes. Um, we did amazingly well. And so we are super happy with how well our internet access has been through the storm. We were able to trade our Wi-Fi for some of their power. We are able to get one room cool. And that room was the living room because you're going to want to pick the room you spend the most hours in. Mm-hmm. And so the room we spend 16 hours a day in normally was the living room. We cooled it. And Crystal and I largely slept in recliners. Ellie put up with the bed. Yeah. I don't know what she was thinking, but that's her decision. But no, it was nice to have a hotel that we all three could share and hang out in and be cool in and relax in and do that. And most importantly, we got a few nice meals out. Yes. And we, um, that was nice too. And we got to pick up some supplies for us and for some of our friends who have even less access to stuff than we did. Right. 
So about three other three of our friends we brought in stuff for. Mm-hmm. And that went really, really well. So yeah, I mean, honestly, where we're at now, we're recording this on Labor Day, Monday, and we're going to be uploading pretty much right after we're done recording. Um, we are in a pretty good place. Uh, the main thing is we need some mental health time. Yeah. I was planning on returning to work tomorrow. I don't think that's happening. I know you have some training tomorrow. I do. And it's weird because my work is officially closed until the 13th. But because I switched to a new position. Literally the the day day the storm hit. (laughs) Yes. That Monday. Yes. That Monday was supposed to be my first day at my new job. Um, I've been in contact with with people there but yeah everything's still on track and everything's good i I would have rather have had a different first week experience let's just leave it at there yeah i i don't uh disagree but i'm happy for you that everything's still good with this new job and that you're well and that everyone seems to be well and Mm -hmm. right now um everyone we know is fine they either evacuated and are safe physically and mentally elsewhere or they are doing well here. About half, about 50% of our friends have power back. Yeah. Now, one of the frustrating ones is our neighbors, literally two streets over. Yes. Got power for two hours. Yeah. They got the little uh, taint tickle of that power. <laughs> and then they came along and, and took it off again. And it's been off for now two days. Yeah. And this is the, the neighbors who the last storm and during Zeta... Um, they work the haunt and a tree fell on their house. You'll, you probably remember us talking about that. Well, now they are without power. So we are, we are still, you know, doing what we can for them too. Yeah, we have Luckily, a... it has dropped a few degrees outside. It's no longer, you know, a serious heat index. Yeah, like we were dealing with heat indexes around 110, peaking at about 110. Yeah. Um, at various points over the past week. And, yeah, so when we say that the living room was cooled during the day, it was about 82. <coughs> yeah. It was not, you know. Not by any means a normal room no. temperature situation. No. So, yeah. We are, like I said, we're doing much better, though. We're in a decent situation. I don't think I'm returning to work on uh, tomorrow. I think I'm going to take that day, too. Yeah. May return Wednesday. May wait until Thursday. Yeah. So that way I can get something up on my sites this week and set myself up for a, a full be- re- restart next week. But yeah, it's been, um, yeah, I think I need another day or two. It's been very difficult mentally, largely because part of it's been because, uh, since we fared as well as we did and we were as lucky as we were, we've been spending nearly all of our energy trying to help friends and neighbors. Yes. Everything from getting them access to our Wi-Fi, to the power station we created up front. To you having a very interesting experience this morning. <laughs> yeah, we had to evacuate our friend Chinchilla. Yeah. Um, right after the storm. I, I, I know jack shit about Chinchilla. So if like anyone listening is like, oh, he's a Chinchilla idiot. Yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> I admit it. Okay, you can't insult me with that. <laughs> I know nothing about chinchillas other than they make great coats. <laughs> yeah. I know nothing about this concept of chinchillas as pets. I mean, you were, like, Googling shit in the car, and it's like, they live at 14,000 feet. I'm like, what the fuck are they doing three feet below sea level in New Orleans? <laughs> Who the fuck did that? But anyways, <laughs> um, after the storm and after she lost power, apparently chinchillas cannot survive heat, partly because of their very rich fur coat. And so we evacuated two of her, her two chins, to a chinchilla rescue, which is A, a thing. Yes. And B, they had power out in Avondale, which is a good haul from where we are and toward where the storm actually hit. The storm didn't actually hit New Orleans, to be very, very clear about this. It hit well to the west of us. Right. <laughs> the worst of it was felt more toward um, the Baton Rouge side of things than it was toward us. Mm-hmm. Uh, we largely avoided the worst of it. But... Point being, so we go out there, we drop them off. Uh, this was at af- like day after, like Monday or Tuesday. Yeah. And then t- today, oh, just a week later, they lost the generator. Their big, beautiful whole home generator blew a head gasket. And so now the chins are dying. We show up 
And there had been a miscommunication between our friend and the chinchilla rescue and us. Apparently, everybody thought everyone else had the chinchilla cage. Yeah. <laughs> to transport them. And none of us did. And so I ended up with a chinchilla in a Pepsi box. <laughs> yes. <laughs> having to play one whole whack-a-mole to keep the chin from popping out of the top. Yes. Gentle whack-a-mole, not like hitting with a hammer, but no. like a gentle version of whack-a-mole. And um, keep it cool and keep it in the dark and keep it in there. And we had to hold it for about you know, 30, 40-ish minutes. Yes, because it, it was not a uh, a short drive. No. As we said, it was it was a bit out of the way. And um, the other thing that we learned is that chinchillas can run 15 miles per hour. So yeah. you don't want it getting out. No. And in an enclosed space, like a car especially. Yes. <laughs> I could see that leading to chaos. And accidents and also just like, you know, comic book-like experiences. Yes. So no, the, the chin ended up making it. Chin is fine. Chin is cool and doing well. Everybody's happy. Um, it all worked out, but Jesus, what a week it's been. And, you know, I'll be happy for some break time from this chaos and then a return to normalcy. Yeah. Which I'm hoping is what we get. But anyways, in the midst of all this chaos, we had a realization. We were talking about this while the power was out and we were trying not to suffer and die. Mm -hmm. Um, That, hey, you know, being a haunter actually kind of sort of put us in a good position for the hurricane. Yeah. And so that's what we're going to talk about this week is the seven ways being a haunter helped us during this storm. Helped us weather it, helped us prepare for it, helped us get through it, and helped us help others, too. Uh, So that leads to this week's question of the week real fast, which is related. What haunting skills have helped you during a challenging time? What's your story of a trying time in your life that being a haunter helped you out? Let us know in the uh, various methods before. We're Haunt Weekly on Twitter, Haunt Weekly on Facebook, YouTube.com slash Haunt Weekly. Leave a comment there. Leave a comment, like I said, on Facebook. Leave it anywhere you want to. We will compile your answers and discuss next week. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. Anyways, getting into this week's actual show notes. We um, had a bit of a hurricane. To update real fast, though, on the New Orleans area haunts. As of my writing of these show notes yesterday, <clears throat> I've not checked today, only New Orleans Nightmare had said anything, the 13th floor one. Right. And they said they were delaying their opening. They didn't say how long or to what end, but they said they're postponing their opening. Yes, and part of that is that they they are in an area that is much more without power than we are. Yeah. Because they're in Jefferson Parish, and Jefferson Parish still has... A lot of places that are down, and they were west of us, so yeah. they, they took... There, there's a real divide inside the city between things on the eastern side, like we are, mm-hmm. and things on the western side of the city, like New Orleans Nightmare and Metairie, Kenner, and all that stuff. Right. <coughs> they got hit much harder, both in terms of wind and rain, and I don't know if they took damage. I mean, I've not seen anything. I, I follow several people there. I don't mm-hmm. have any news from them. Mm-mm. Um and like I said, I'm only following the official Facebook releases, but they said they're postponing their opening. Rise, Thirteenth Gate, and Mortuary have said pretty much nothing. Once mm-hmm. again, this is as of my checking yesterday. So yeah, but all in all, like I said, we were very lucky. We were in a good part of the city, and we were in a great position with our friends and neighbors. Yes, and there was no major flooding, and the levees and the pump systems worked as they were designed to. Um, yeah. That might be the first time in a while that that's happened. I think it might be the first time that can be said. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyways. So, anyways, this week, like I said, seven ways being a haunter helped us survive the hurricane. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'll take the first one. Sure. Our rapport with our neighbors and our neighborhood. Yes. This was a big one. New Orleans is known for being kind of a busybody, everybody knows everyone neighborhood. Not ours. We are in a very suburban part of New Orleans. We have a New Orleans address. Yes. We pay New Orleans taxes. We have, you know, all the the things that come in New Orleans, including the streets. Yeah. But our neighborhood is very, very suburban. We don't have the traditional shotgun houses, for example. We have the ranch-style houses you see in suburban. They're built in the 50s and 60s. In Mm -hmm. fact, our house was built in the 60s. Yeah. 
Um, we're very much a keep to yourself neighborhood, but we know our neighbors very well and they know us. And the reason is because of the haunt. That relationship is how we got power. Right. And, and that goes back to being a good neighbor whenever to your neighbors yeah. when you're a haunt. When you're a home haunter in this yeah. case. Yeah. Yeah. Or just a, a, a four, for profit haunt mm-hmm. because we know of one at least that we reported on that did not get its license renewed because they weren't good neighbors. Yeah, that's true. That is a good point. So yeah, you know we have been we put a lot of effort into being good neighbors yeah. and being good members of our community, and that has paid dividends. It got us power. It also got us a lot of intel and information we otherwise might not have had. Right. <laughs> um, because. We learned about resources and and supplies that were available that we might not otherwise have known. I think we first learned about where ice was from neighbors. Um, It was so close. Um, But I I know that I went around the neighborhood after we got ice. And I verified that, yes, ice existed on the West Bank to where we could just go pick it up. That was such a beautiful day. If If you've ever been... And a power outage without ice. You know what I'm talking about. An extended power outage. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Yes. We finally got we finally got ice on Friday, I think. Yeah, Thursday or Friday. I can't remember which one. I think it was Thursday, actually, because we had all day Friday, and we left Saturday morning. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I don't remember. The days blend together. But I went around the neighborhood and told, knocked on doors if people were home and told them, hey, go here made little cards with the address. This has ice and water and food. If you need it, yeah, go get it. And several people had not heard. But yeah, we learned a lot of the stuff because by being the neighbors, everyone knows we become the center repository for information. Yep. People come to us with information they glean quickly Mm -hmm. and we get a chance to spread that information out. Yeah. It is a beautiful thing, and our rapport with our neighbors really did a lot to help us. We were able to help them. They were able to help us. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't think we would have been in that position, because we would have been starting way behind. We've been introducing ourselves to a lot of these people. Yeah. I mean, just imagine, like, John B. and some of the others around our neighborhood, if we had not met them to the hall. Now we got to introduce ourselves and Mm -hmm. start from square one. Yeah. Yeah, and there were some... Ain't nobody got time for that. Yeah, and there was some of that, but I mean, if you stayed through the storm and you saw people beforehand who were staying, it was also a bridge. It, yeah. it is also easier to introduce yourself. And, and the number of people who came to us and said, oh, yeah, y'all the one that run the haunted house. Yeah. Um, yeah. When we're offering free Wi-Fi and things like that, it was, it was very touching, too. So. Yeah, in fact, um, our Wi-Fi has gotten people from the East Bank and from Jefferson Parish because of the citywide outage. They're mm-hmm. coming over and they're... Using our Wi-Fi to file for FEMA assistance and, and insurance FEMA. claims and whatever else, yeah. yeah. And apparently some city workers are doing the social media post to get, you yeah. know, information out via our Wi-Fi. Yeah. So Bernie Baxter is out there as a good for the neighborhood. Indeed. Okay, the second item. All of the physical resources. Yes. <laughs> when I when I put this down, I wrote so many extension cords because yes. that was the first thing that leapt to mind. Right. But Crystal correctly pointed out it wasn't just extension cords. No. The extension cords were a big part of it. They were. Yes. Um. That that is how we got the the two houses. Yeah. Bridged. <laughs> bridged were many many extension cords. Um, but we also have flashlights all mm. over the haunted house, plus the lanterns that we, we have for emergency situations. And we've been able to loan those out as needed. Mm-hmm. Um, we have extra batteries for things. We have <coughs> lights. Um, yeah, a lot of the stuff you we use in the haunt become hurricane supplies. And one of the funny things, like, we were talking about the, the, the extension cord. So he ran over 150 feet of extension cord yeah. over the course of this. And here's the crazy part. We didn't actually touch our giant container of extension cords. No. no. These were just the ones that were lying around doing other, th- not doing anything elsewhere. No. We, we never even opened the shed to get the giant box of extension cords. That no. We, we used to power the, the yard display. Yeah, these are the ones that are zip-tied to the top of our queue line to run lights in the queue line. 
Yeah, we, we ended up running 150 feet of extension cords and not even touching our main collection of extension cords. Yes, I'm pretty sure that our neighbors that are one street over that need power, if we needed to, we could run <laughs> cords from their house to ours. Yeah, these were just the extra ones. But like you said, it also was a matter of all the flashlights we had, all the batteries we had, all yeah. the fans we had. Yeah, and if we had lost internet and cell access, we have walkie-talkies. We could have handed out to people and said, hey, you know, here's how to get in touch with us. Yeah, stay online, too, and, you know, try to keep it charged. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, we really, really, really were grateful for all of the stuff we bought for the haunt originally that ended up being super useful uh, when the time was necessary to run the to take care of the hurricane stuff. Yeah, yeah, it made it much easier because there's no way you're going to be able to go and buy that stuff with everything closed. Yeah, I mean there uh, were some hardware stores starting to open at the end of the week, but there were also long lines for those because they had generators. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> okay, item number three. The ability and the skill of repairing under duress. Yes. Oh, man. If you've ever had to do emergency repairs in an open haunt. Yes. You have an experience that is super useful in a storm or any kind of natural disaster like this. No kidding. And, you know, those first years that we were open before we learned to build properly, um, I got a lot of experience Mm -hmm. fixing stuff on the fly. And I know you did, too. Yeah. And and for us, this manifested in us getting power hooked up as the storm was hitting. Yes. We had um, put one cord into our neighbor's house Mm -hmm. early. Yeah. Um, We wound up using two. Um, yeah, because just because our cooler or AC is so picky. It is. It needs one cord. It only likes this one cord. Being plugged and, into its own outlet. Yes, with nothing else on the line. Yeah, Fine. You, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's crazy pants how particular that thing is, but whatever. Yeah, so basically Jonathan wound up going and, and plugging in a second cord during the storm. And running the rest of the electric wires, too. Yeah. <laughs> we got it done, but that's just it. it, it and we were lucky because we lost power, like I said, super early as the storm was hitting that Sunday. Right. I mean, I think we lost it before 9 a.m. and the storm wasn't even really hitting it till like 4. Yeah. And so, yeah, there was a little bit of wind and a little bit of rain, but nothing at that point, nothing, I would say, wild or crazy for the area. No. And so I just went, jumped the fence, plugged it in, ran it the other way, and... Redid the wiring. Yeah. And got it all working. And that way, we were able to keep electricity through the entirety of the storm. And with that electricity, we kept the internet going. <laughs> yes. Other than whenever the gore box decided to go on a couple of jaunts and unplug everything. Um, but that was fixed when it lost a wheel. Yeah. And I put it in a better place. Uh, but yeah, basically... <clears throat> That ability and that experience, because uh, let's be honest, uh, repairing like that in a haunt is ultimately low. It doesn't feel low risk. No. But it's low risk. No yeah. one's going to die or be hurt if you're not able to get something fixed. Yeah. Like, we knew exactly where our zip ties were we so that we could get the power cords up off the ground so they weren't sitting in water whenever, you know, mm-hmm. the storm was blowing. Yeah. Um. That's That's one of those things. We walked out and said, oh, shit, we got to get that out of there. Um, because we don't usually have any water pool on where it was at, but we had about an inch and a half or so that was starting to pool. But never enough to get into the house or anything. Oh, no, 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 nothing. Had a ways to go before that was a risk. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't damaged to property or cars or anything like that. Yeah, we managed to get the whole thing done in about 10 minutes and it's a very similar energy to having to fix while the haunt is open. And if you're used to that energy, it's such a help because you're already in the right mindset. You know what you have to do. You know where your tools are. You know where that bug out box is. Mm -hmm. You're ready to get it done. Yeah, I don't think we struggled to find anything because we knew where to put our hands on it. Yeah, I mean, we're okay. And the straight truth here, we're terrible about where we leave our tools. (laughs) Yes. In general. 
<laughs> but when it comes to the bug out boxes for the haunt uh -huh. and haunt repairs, those are immaculate. <laughs> yes. Yes. While the haunt is being built, who knows where tools go? They go missing for hours. I have two impact drivers, <laughs> two Makita impact drivers, one drill and one reciprocating saw. I think I know where two out of the four are. Yeah. <clears throat> and we um we actually spent some time looking for the drill which wound up being in my office because I'd used it to to Do put a hole stuff, into yeah. a mini. <clears throat> but I And we needed that. it for the battery, not for the drill. Right. <laughs> the battery's attached to it, but the batteries um one tip I'm going to give everyone if you have any kind of cordless tool set, I mean Makita, Ryobi, Dewalt, what Milwaukee, whatever, doesn't matter. Make sure to buy the USB adapter for the battery. Yes. It's like five bucks. Yep. Five, ten bucks. Those things are the largest backup batteries you'll ever have. Yes. Those are what we're loaning out to um, our friends, our friends who, who still over. have no power. Because it, it, it holds a charge with teenagers using them for a all day. day. Yeah. They're 30,000. Ours, the ones we have are 30,000 milliamp hours. Or three amp hours. And um, basically the largest backup battery you can buy for like at a Best Buy or something. Yeah. It's about a third of that. Right. And we have two of those. And they charge super quick. They charge them at 15 minutes. Yeah. So, so that is an amazing thing to do. If you have not done that, I encourage you to do that. Because you probably keep those batteries charged just by happenstance. Right. And that USB charger, if there's a blizzard or if there's any kind of storm that knocks out power for an extended period of time, that can be a way to keep your phones, tablets, and so forth online for an extended period of time. Yeah, we're actually, um, well, I'm going to try again to convince them to buy their own battery and little adapter, even though they don't have the tool set and don't need the tool set, but they need the battery for when the power goes out. Yeah. It, it's such a useful thing, and honestly, I remember when I realized there was a USB adapter for it. Yeah. <laughs> I think that might be in the, the very first Makita accessory outside of the initial pack. We bought one of those giant yeah. packs. I think it was the first accessory we bought outside that pack was that. It was. And we bought the second impact driver later. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And speaking of all this, <laughs> number four is the mentality of be prepared. Yeah, screw Boy Scouts. Scar's where it's at for this one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but Haunting, we've talked about this before, doing your pre-mortems and all that. Yeah. Preparedness is something that Haunting is all about. You're planning for an event. You know how to prepare for something. So you say, if X happens, we do Y. If Y happens, we do Z. Yeah. <clears throat> and on down the list. Uh, we have rules and policies here that we have at this house that have helped keep us, A, safe, and B, relatively comfortable and confident. One is, if there is any storm in the Gulf, even if it's not necessarily pointed at us, right? we top off all the vehicles. Yeah. Yes. I cannot believe how many people do not fill up their vehicles before the storm hits and then have trouble finding gas afterwards. And it leads to horrible situations. It, it does, because at that point, not only are there not gas stations open, but what gas is available, you're fighting with generator owners, you're fighting with work trucks right. that need to gas for actually getting around and doing things. Mm -hmm. you're, you're fighting people that have a much, even you can argue, a much more urgent need for it. Yes. So... Yeah, and I was completely stunned by the number of people who were like, yeah, my car's almost empty. And it's like, well, you had, a, we filled up the minute there was a hint anything was going to be in the Gulf at all. Yeah. Because here's the thing. We have two vehicles. One has a range, Ellie's car has a range of about 400 miles. It's the hybrid. It's got a super big yeah. tank, sips gasoline, diddly diddly dee. It's got a range of about 250 miles. Ours has a smaller tank and is a regular car. But it still has a range of about 300 miles if you're on the highway. Yeah. 300 miles is plenty to get out of the storm zone if you need to. Well, yeah, because, I mean, with this storm, especially because it was so compact, about mm -hmm. 50 miles was easily yeah. well, all you needed. We got to Bay St. Louis, which is only about 60, 70 miles away, yeah. and it was like nothing had happened. Exactly. 
other than, you know, <coughs> shelves being bare because people were doing the th same thing we were doing yeah. and making supply runs to bring back stuff. Yeah, but it, it was, from a wind and storm damage perspective, there was no indication anything had hit. Oh, no, no. Yeah. I, I saw nothing. So, yeah, you, we had plenty of fuel, A, to toot around town if needed, and we did end up having to do that some. Right, like with the chins <coughs> and with taking ice to that same friend yeah um and to another friend who um also cannot leave her house yeah so we did a little too long around town but we still had plenty of fuel to get out in an emergency and that's exactly what we did yeah was we got into ellie's car she still had damn near 300 miles of range after a week yeah <clears throat> and that was plenty we didn't actually fill up until the way back Mm -hmm. and, and that was and that was still only half a tank. Yeah, she still had 250 miles yeah. that she could have driven. No, we still had a lot of range left. So, you know, what I'm saying is this, is that mentality be prepared where you plan, you look at what could happen, you plan for that, you set a plan in place, and then you enact it. <laughs> yes, and this this is a way to talk about, you know, if tits go completely up, you know, yeah. everything gets topsy-turvy. Because we had talked about, okay, if the house does start flooding, what do we do? How do we get to where we need to be? What do we need to, to take to higher ground? You know, because we have a split level. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the bottom, um, we've got two computers down there. We could take them up. We've got an attic that we could get into if we needed to. Um, so there are, there are things that we talk about in preparation for absolute catastrophic failure of everything yeah and we have some pretty i want uh, yeah because of that we've had some pretty dark plans for dark eventualities right never had to use them no but they are there but i, I think the, the the less dark plans are what saved us this time because we yeah. had plenty of gas our power and wi-fi plans have been in place for years yes um we knew roughly what to expect and were prepared for it. Yeah. And, you know, other things that we did that we learned from other storms is we get cash out mm -hmm. before the storm. That way, if ATMs are down, which a lot of them were, um, we have cash to pay for things. Because yeah. stores will open up to sell what their shelf-stable items. Yeah. But they might not have access, especially if Internet's down, they might not have access to their credit card readers. Exactly. And that was something that really was was very interesting was a lot of people had no cash. Yeah. And I understand. I rarely have cash either. Yeah. I consider myself cash adverse, actually. I hate cash. Yeah. But with a storm situation, you need cash. And that's one like so one of the things we do is we get five hundred dollars. And getting the, the money out and getting the gas, <clears throat> those are two things that are completely safe to do. Worst case scenario, the storm goes goes and disappears. We use the gas yeah. <laughs> just normally, and we put the cash back in the account. Yeah. We look silly going back to the ATM and putting the cash back in. Yeah, or we, we just keep it until after storm season to make sure yeah. we don't need it again. We've got a place to put it for that yeah. um, so that it doesn't get accidentally spent. Yeah, it, it's we're not like we're spending resources here that we won't use if, if something doesn't happen. Right. Another thing we did was we have an ice machine. We yep. started bagging ice as soon as it looked like it was coming our way. That way we had a giant bag of ice that lasted us um, Several almost, days. <laughs> yeah, and, until Wednesday or Tuesday or Wednesday. Yeah, we only went one day completely without ice, I think. Yeah, which was a big help, a huge help. And we also got shelf-stable supplies, food and stuff, to make sure that we had, um, we were, but, but yeah, had what we needed, and we could give to people who didn't. This preparedness, though, is no different than haunts having those plans for a shooter, a shooting right. incident, than having a plan for you know COVID nineteen or for or violent, a fire or fire or anything else. You already know the eventualities you have to think of and you write plans for them for your haunt. Yeah. Extend that into your day-to-day -day life and any other natural disaster you may see. It's what we're trying to say. Exactly. Just extend that mindset. Exactly. Because you know how to do emergency planning. Exactly. And that leads to number five, which is the ability to keep calm. Yes. If you panic 
in a haunt, when things are going sideways in a haunt, things will get worse. As my dad has always yeah. said, no situation was ever improved by someone panicking. Very true. <laughs> I, I I see no flaws in that statement. The, the, no no lies detected. It's a very very true statement. No situation that was ever improved by someone panicking. Be calm. Focus on what you can do. Mm-hmm. Prioritize that. Keep moving forward, and that includes even when it's super hot and you're super tired and your brain's stopping to function. Yeah. Which is a feeling every haunter should be very familiar with. Yes. <laughs> yes. Because. I know. Um, we often build during the hot season, so we know what it's like, and we know how we act whenever we get too hot. Yeah, which is we get snippy. <coughs> like, a, and the th- thing is this though: when when things go sideways, you're never going to come up with a perfect solution. Your response will never be a hundred percent. Right. <clears throat> That's okay. That is not a ding on you. What you do with that is you take that information and your post mortem. You figure out, okay, what can we do better? And you make that plan. Yeah, like we've got a list of things that we're going to have for the next storm. Yeah. We've already started our season. list for yeah. the next one. And one of them may be our own whole home generator, this pace. Yeah, that's what we're hoping. Uh, but yeah, just remember your Hitchhiker's Guide. Don't panic. And if you're a haunter, you should be very panic adverse. Yeah. <laughs> panic resistant, at the very least. Yeah. So yeah. Number six, one of my favorites through this storm is the hyper-local social media skills. And admittedly, okay, I'm kind of cheating with this one because a lot of this also comes from my day job. Yeah. <clears throat> but the haunt has definitely not hurt, especially with the community-facing stuff. I would not know jack shit about next door or mm-hmm. Facebook neighborhoods or any of these tools without the haunt. Yeah, including like the the localized Facebook groups. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got one just for people in Algiers. Um and that helps a lot. Yeah, we were not only able to get the word out about what we were doing, but receive word about important things going on in the neighborhood. Yeah. Yes, like <clears throat> um during the storm somebody posted that one of the major roads had a giant utility pole across mm-hmm. it and not to go that way. Yep. And a similar vein, even though this didn't actually directly impact us, was the closest gas station to us, though not necessarily one I would have thought to go to, Right. had gas and was functioning almost the entire time the store was open, and no one knew to go there, so there'd be huge lines at the ones on the main thoroughfares, Yeah. and they were just sitting empty, Yeah. working pumps, barely anyone there. Yeah, that's where I told my friends to go. If you were following the hyper-local it. social media, you knew that. Yep. But if you didn't have access to it or you weren't doing it, you know, then you never, you didn't get that information. Yeah. <clears throat> and it also, you know, helped with the decision of whether or not to stay or go. Yeah. Because there was a time that we were looking at it and we looked at the traffic and said, it's going to take 15 hours. Because we were talking to our our friends outside of yeah. our normal circle and who we knew were leaving town. And it was taking them 15 hours to make what's normally a four and a half hour drive. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's miserable. And you've got to time it to where you're, you're not in a car in the middle of a storm. Yeah. Yeah. And that is one of the issues. So yeah, but yeah, and there's all. This is also where we're finding out about a lot of places where you can donate your food before it goes bad, so that they can cook it and give it out to your neighborhood, or even just to you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can bring it to them, and they will throw it on the grill. Make me you. my chicken. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that, that, that uh, and that's the thing is one of the things I learned in Katrina in particular. Yeah. About hurricane recovery is for all of the talk about what the president and the governor and even the mayor is doing. Yeah. The real recovery, the real shit, happens on the hyper-local level. Yeah. It happens block by block, tiny neighborhood by tiny neighborhood. Yeah. On a very, very micro level. It doesn't happen on those macro levels. I'm, I'm, every, I'm sure, you know, all the branches of government are doing what they can and so forth. I don't really have any ill feelings but, yeah, the real traction is made on the ground, hyper-locally. Yeah. 
So that, that to me is very important. That's why you need to have that hyper local social media skill, something that we got a lot of from the Haunt. Yes. That's why we're in those groups. Mm-hmm. It's why we subscribe to those apps. Mm-hmm. It's why we do those things. Yeah. So, yeah. And number seven, I had to throw this in. Mm-hmm. It is true. A dark sense of humor. Yes. Here's the thing. During stressful situations like this, you're going to come to a point where mentally you have two choices. Mm-hmm. Laugh or cry. Exactly. You're going to have a reaction. You're going to have a breakdown of some stripe. It's just life, okay? Are you going to laugh or are you going to cry? It's much better, if you can, to laugh. Yeah. Even if it feels completely messed up, feels <laughs> completely inappropriate and wrong, it is so much better for your mental health if you're able to laugh. Yes, and it's not like your dark sense of humor and your dark jokes that are made during those those times are going to leave, you know, the people you trust the most because they're there with you. Hey, don't post this shit like on open Facebook or anything. Don't, don't, don't go making this public. Stick to the group of people, you know, uh, this is appropriate for. And so that, you know, you don't want to cause harm to others, basically. You don't want your jokes to hurt others. So you want to make sure you say in a space where you're not hurting others. Mm -hmm. And, but yeah, but basically if you can laugh at the darkness Things go so much easier. Time passes so much more quickly. Yeah. And you will do so much better. And definitely, haunting has given us, or accelerated, our dark sense of humor. Yes. Yes, it has. I, I don't think it gave it to us. I think that was strong. We both had a dark sense of humor well before the storm. Oh, yes. But definitely. Well before, and well before the haunt, even. But let's be honest, the haunt uh, really accelerated. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, really accelerated. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I know from dealing with Katrina, from dealing with Zeta, from dealing with Isaac, and dealing with all these storms, you're going to hit that moment. And if you can laugh, you bounce back much more quickly. At least I do. Yeah. Maybe others are different. I don't know. But I know for me, <clears throat> being able to laugh, being able to defy <laughs> the expectations. Mm-hmm. It gives me a feeling of power over it. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, there's there's a lot of, of misinformation or, or misguided worry mm-hmm. that gets sent to the people who decide to stay. And that can actually be damaging, going back to what you were talking about, and not, about not wanting to do harm. Yeah. And... And like, okay, one thing that was really frustrating, and this is just, <clears throat> let me get on to your point here, yeah. some straight talk here. Yeah. Um, we posted on Haunt Weekly that we were staying. Yes. And I had waited and posted until right around the drop dead time for getting out. Yeah. Exactly. Because I wanted, because the thing for us is in the run up to the storm, we were playing both sides. Yeah. We were playing the evacuation side on one hand and the staying side on one hand. We were securing everything like we were staying, but also gassing up and preparing the cars like we were leaving. Yeah. We hit the drop dead time the day before. We knew we had to stay now. We were forced to stay. There was no way to get out. Evacuating at that point would have been actively significantly much more dangerous. A couple of people who I know were well-intentioned. Yes. There is no, you know, no hatred here. But No, please, no, no. You're, I, I understand you were well-intentioned. But after the drop dead time, we're like, you need to get out. This is going to be a complete disaster for New Orleans. It's going to be in, in like, wall of text about trying to cause fear of the storm. And it's too late. Yeah. Your time to scare people into evacuating was the day before. Yeah. Like, I... And this was not just on Haunt Weekly, this was on other social media too, but... Yeah. And it was so frustrating because it's like, all you're doing is ramping up an already high anxiety. Yeah, and basically when the decision was made to stay, it was calm. Yeah. I felt calm for the first time in in days after... Because you're no longer wrestling with uncertainty. Exactly. Um... So just keep in mind for anybody who is going through something that we appreciate the love that is shared. And we appreciate the concern. And the concern. 
but especially if it's too late to change that decision. Right. Which it realistically is way earlier than a lot of people think it is. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people seem to think, yeah, you still got 12 hours to get out. No, you don't. No. No, no, not no. if it takes 15 hours to get somewhere. And, and not if it takes 15 hours to get somewhere, and not if, you know, you need to travel X number of miles to get away from it. You, you and can't. there were a lot of people who died in Katrina on highways. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, this, and this storm in particular, hitting on the anniversary, had a lot of PTSD triggers. Yeah. Um, and, and that was one of the things the mayor locally did not call for mandatory evacuation. Yeah. Inside the levy system. Right. And and what we were hearing from our government officials was very different than what was being told on national news. Yeah. I get that. Because on Katrina, it was like, you need to evacuate now. If you are staying, you need to get a permanent marker and write your social security number on your body somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, that was not the case here. No. This was, if you have medical issues and can't live without power, then leave. If you are able to leave and don't want the discomfort of being here right. during the aftermath, leave. Yeah. <clears throat> it was a very different feeling of the information we were getting locally. I made the choice to stay personally, and my contribution to the group conversation was based upon micro forecasts. Yeah. I knew what winds we were expecting, and we got a little bit stronger than I had anticipated, but not significantly. No. I knew how much storm surge we were expecting, and I know from experience, I actually briefly worked at the Corps of Engineers after Katrina, I know a great deal about the levee system around here, so I knew the levees would be fine. Yeah. <clears throat> I was very confident in that, <clears throat> and I knew that we weren't going to see winds at our house yeah. that were higher than what we had survived like during Zeta. Right. Like, I think Zeta had higher winds still. Yeah. At least where we sit, it had higher winds. Exactly. You have to remember, because Zeta went right over our heads. We saw the eye of Zeta. Yeah. The eye was so weird. Yeah, it was. We did not see the eye of this storm. The eye was 40 miles west of us. Right. And that's a big difference. Yeah, it sounds really close, but it really does make all the difference. It does. And, you know, other than the only thing we couldn't have predicted and the thing we, you know, we can say we screwed up is we did not predict that basically the entire New Orleans power grid was eight extension cords hooked into the same outlet, all going west. (laughs) Yes. And some of you haunters know what we're talking about because that's how you run your haunt. (laughs) Yeah. Don't run your haunt that way either. Don't run your haunt and don't run your municipal power grid that way. No. Bad. Bad haunter. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, because... Bad for haunts, bad for cities. And we're back to the dark humor. Yes. But no, that was the thing. And that was the thing we did not know and yeah. could not have predicted. No. But even then, I believe the decision to stay was the absolute right one. Largely because of how much good we were able to do for others who couldn't evacuate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do feel that we have done a ton of good. And like I said, if I take this week or much of this week off... You know, think of it as my vacation from my <laughs> from from Storm. from this. Yeah. I'm not going to feel guilty about it. No, no, I'm already planning that. You know, once things return and settle down, some I'm going to take a Friday or a Monday off if I can. Yeah, and we're going to go somewhere and just enjoy being, being there. somewhere. Yeah, it's been a, <laughs> a long week. We're tired. But honestly, I think the decision we made was the right one. Yeah. And I think that us being haunters gave us a lot of skills that we use not only to make ourselves more comfortable Mm -hmm. and safer, but also our neighbors, our friends, and others, too. So yeah, I am very grateful to be a haunter right now. Mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for all that has taught me because I definitely would not be as useful at the repair work. <laughs> no. Yeah. Without that. It's, yeah. it's amazing how quickly you learn to repair things when you run a haunt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that is a skill you pick up or you die. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, yeah, I'm very grateful for this. And, yeah, that's all. That's really all I want to say. It, it's I, I'm appreciative of haunting and the skills it gave me. We may not be the Boy Scouts. We're a hell of a lot scarier. <laughs> well, on that note, everyone, I think we'll wind it down. We're at about the 50-minute mark, so it's about perfect, honestly. 
Thank you very much for joining us and putting up with what I know was a rambling coffee, um, not ideal from an audio standpoint podcast. We're hoping to be back in the regular studio next week. We're hoping to have a, a better, at least a better setup somewhere. It has been a wild two weeks. We appreciate you putting up with us. Definitely take some time. Go to hauntweekly.com or hauntweekly on Twitter or hauntweekly on Facebook. Check out previous episodes there. Let us know uh, if there's anything you want to see us talk about or hear, listen to us talk about or any guests you think we should have on. We're hoping to get this train rolling again properly very shortly. Um, failing that, go to youtube.com slash hauntweekly. Once again, give us a subscribe there. It's a big help. Find us at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast from. We greatly appreciate your love there. And hopefully in the future, Sundays, 8 p.m. Central, 9 p.m. Eastern, you'll be able to catch us live, facebook.com slash hauntweekly, as we record these and engage with the chat. I miss those times now. I really do. Me too. But until next time, I'm Jonathan. I'm Crystal. And this was Haunt Weekly episode 301, discussing the ways being a haunter helped us through this hurricane. We will see you all next week.